Hello, nerds, and welcome to another Civ 6 Leader Pass Breakdown video. Today we're going through the third pack. I can't believe we're already halfway through the Leader Pass. But today we'll be talking about new leaders like Quin Chi Huang, the Unifier, Wu Zetan, and Yongle. Uh, or Yongle is how the internet has deemed the appropriate way to pronounce him. Stick through the entire video. I'm going to be giving some pretty in-depth breakdowns of, of strategies I think will be really, really well, and hopefully you learn something through this video. But let's go ahead and jump into it. Now, like I always like to do, let's talk about the original China before we break down the new ones, just to get everyone on the same page, kind of talk about them. So I generally say that Quinn, now Mandate of Heaven, is one of the best culture civs in the game, specifically because of all of these abilities and how really well they all synergize together. His leader ability, the first emperor, lets you spend builder charges on ancient and classical wonders to complete 15% of the wonders cost. Uh, this actually combines really well with Corvée, which gives you an additional 15% towards ancient and classical wonders. If you're not familiar, that's 15 plus 15 when using a builder charge. So that's 30% of a wonder, which means you can finish them incredibly fast. You also have this really unique ability to be able to work on multiple wonders at the same time. For instance, if we have a Apadana here with a builder on it and a Stonehenge right here with another builder on it, you can just swap the production queue around and for instance, have Apadana first, chuck this builder, swap the queue around, put Stonehenge up, chuck this builder, and then keep doing that while working on a third item. Uh, if you've seen Bose's recent, I built 53 wonders all in one single game, all the wonders in the game as China on Deity, you'll be familiar with with that mechanic. It's a really awesome mechanic. This, of course, synergizes directly with Dynastic Circle. Uh, you got Eureka's Inspirations provide 50% of the civics and technologies instead of 40%. A little bit extra off the top, always nice. But whenever you complete a wonder, receive a random Eureka and Inspiration from the era of that wonder, if available. This is fantastic because it not only does it keep you relevant in hitting your tech boost through the ancient and classical era when you're taking the time to build wonders instead of prioritizing all of these little mini quests. It's just really good throughout the entire game. You just a random boost here, random boost there. You know, like, oh, I can't build two harbors this this game. Uh, oh, you built Forbidden City? Congrats, you get that for free. Like, it's just it's just a really nice one. It's something you can't control directly, but it's just, it's just nice. <laughs> it's just always nice. The Crouching Tiger is a unique unit that is a medieval era range unit that is unlocked the same time as crossbows. So right here, but note, it is a separate unit. It is not a crossbow replacement. It's just you can build crossbows or Crouching Tigers. Uh, I always like building Crouching Tigers because they're incredibly nice defensive unit. They have 10 more combat range strength than archers do. But because they only have a range of one, they are terrible offensive units. Generally, if you have a army, you're going to want to have your archers in the back protected by a line of melee units like men at arms to, to defend them i once tried to push <laughs> i once tried to push one of my fronts with the crouching tigers and then a bunch of knights came through and just slaughter them um but they are very nice for sitting inside your cities and defending yourself from the ai attacking you especially if you got a little bit greedy and you were building a bunch of wonders and you didn't have much of an army these units can kind of clean up and save you from losing a city which is very 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 nice. But if you're going on the offense, definitely you still have the ability to play with crossbows. Now the Great Wall is a one of the best tile improvements in the game. It's really hard to use, but I, I, I implore you. It is so, it is so good. You get gold and you get defense strength if you stand on it with a military unit. It gets plus two gold base, but you get an additional plus two gold for every adjacent wall next to it. And then you also get plus two culture for each adjacent wall next to it. So you can get plus six gold and plus four culture tiles all throughout your entire empire. Once you get to castles, so getting to castles as soon as possible is really, really imperative as China, which is why when I play China, I generally go for campuses pretty early into the game to try to get my technology up to castles. That way, once you are here at castles and you have a bunch of great walls put down and you have a bunch of wonders built, you get a huge boost of culture throughout the game, which will really help you fly through the culture tree. I generally don't build a ton of theater squares as China. I might build one or two here. I might go for a entertainment complex for the Colosseum to get culture subsidized there. I might go for a mausoleum to try to get more out of engineers to help me with later wonders where I don't 
get to use builders on them. What you kind of really want is to get science so that you can get up here, uh, one to industrialization, but then also to flight. Because once you get to flight, you get tourism based of all of your great wall tiles, equal to the amount of culture they're making. If you can get here early, you can have a ton of tourism. It's incredibly strong. And most of the AI don't have enough culture to really stop you at this point. If you beeline for flight and then you're making as much culture as you can to get through the culture tree. Again, you don't need much in theater squares. I've seen people play this, this and win the game in less than 150 turns on DD. China is incredibly, incredibly good. He's just a little bit tricky to try to balance getting your settling, get your commercial hubs and your traders and your districts while also balancing trying not to build every single one of the game because uh, you can build a lot of them. You get him to be very greedy with it, but it's a ton of fun. I would say he's definitely the best wonder builder of all the wonder building civs, and I, and I would argue the most fun because of the way you can use builder charges to boost things. Now, Kublai Khan China plays very similar to Quinn China. You, of course, have all the same abilities, but he's a little bit more of an economic version of China. You get a free economic policy slot in any government, and you get random Eurekas and inspirations when establishing a trading post in another civilization for the first time. Now, this synergizes directly with Dynastic Cycle, so they're slightly better Eurekas. But remember, if you're playing a standard eight-person game, there's only seven There's only seven other civs to trade with, so that's essentially seven Eurekas and inspirations throughout the course of the entire game. It's not a lot, but remember, the strongest part of trading with other sieves is actually the tourism modifier that you'll get. You'll get additional 25% tourism from trading with every civilization in the game, uh, and that is multiplied by every single individual sieve. So I think Kublai Khan really is here to encourage you Go the extra mile to make sure that you're trading with other, every other sieve. If you're close to maybe three sieves on one continent, but the other continent is a bunch of other sieves that are out of trade range, you will want to try to trade with them no matter what. Maybe it's by establishing a trading post halfway there so that you extend the range of your trade route to another civilization. Or you can go ahead and settle a colony that's closer to them and make sure you get your trade route with them that way. But that's why Kublai Khan is good. He utilizes trade early. He's still very defensive with his improvements and units, but you're gonna go a more economic route. You're gonna wanna try to get your harbors and or commercial hubs built early, depending on if you're on rivers or if you're on the coast. And you wanna keep an eye out for certain wonders that synergize well with trade, like Colossus, which gives you a free trade route and you can trade with more sieves things like banks and shipyards to improve those districts and maybe certain things like Torre de Belém that really helps on your international trade route income. But I would say after your commercials, you still want to go for heavy campuses, maybe some theater squares, a coliseum, building wonders throughout the game when you can. You're just going to go, you're just going to focus less on wonders compared to Quinn. Now, of course, there are some great people you're gonna wanna keep your eye out for. Specifically, Sarah Breedlove, who you should be able to get if you're going strong commercials anyway. She's a great merchant of the modern era, and she gives you 25% tourism rate towards civilizations you have a trade route to. This will go directly with online communities here, which will give you an additional 50% tourism output to the civilizations you have a trade route with. So between the passive 25%, Sarah Breed loves 25%, and then 50% tourism from online communities, you can have a total of 100% tourism. Your tourism is literally doubled to everyone you have a trade route with, and you will have a trade route with every single civ in the game because you are prioritizing this, this ability here. Very, very good Civ for getting new players comfortable with this idea, but also with experienced players, convincing them to make sure that you're trading with every single Civ in the game. Now, while the original Quinn and Kublai Khan were both relatively defensive slash and or peaceful with their setups, Quinn the Unifier <laughs> is uh, quite a bit different. Now, I've been trying to piece together how I feel about this Civ because from every corner of the internet, there has been a wide range of opinions about him. Everything from he's super OP and completely broken to he's completely garbage and his ability is completely worthless. It's, it, it's incredible how wide people's opinion on him have been. But let's, let's, let's just dive into this, all right? 36 Stratum's melee units receive the Convert Barbarians action. If you're not familiar, this is an ability that some apostles and even one of the great generals have. It's taken from Heathen Conversion. 
which is a promotion for apostles where you can convert all adjacent barbarians to your side by using a religious charge, or Boudica, who is a great general. She's a classical era general, and when we retire her, you convert adjacent barbarian units to your control. So Quinn here has this ability, but he has his ability on every single one of his melee class units. This action converts barbarian units into your units, but it removes the melee unit. There is a lot going into this ability that we need to clear up. So first of all, a melee unit is a melee class unit. Warriors are a melee class unit who upgrade to swordsmen, who upgrade to men at arms, musketmen, line infantry, infantry, you know, mechanized infantry, that that tree. It does not include spearmen. This is a this is an anti-cavalry class unit and all of their upgrades. It does not include scouts who are recon class unit. It doesn't matter if these units have melee attacks. They are a recon or anti-cavalry unit. Uh, galleys are a melee naval class unit, so they do not have the ability. It is literally just the warrior upgrade path that has this ability. You can see right here, there's a button right here to convert adjacent barbarians. As you can imagine, this is an ability <laughs> that is very, very RNG dependent. It depends if you can find barbarians. It depends if you can, if you're able to manipulate the barbarians. However, there's a lot of things that are going for this ability. You can convert any type of barbarian. That includes any class of barbarian. You can convert warriors to your side, spearmen to your side, scouts, slingers. You can convert naval barbarians to your side. If for instance, in a spawn like this, where barbarian galleys who kind of just show up out of nowhere and start pillaging boats. If you had a warrior like on this tile and there's a couple of barbarian boats, you can immediately convert and get those boats, get the early era score for having one of the world's first boats and then go from there. Now, this is one of the few civs that you actually want to spam warriors first instead of scouts because because you have this ability and you have this unique opportunity to, to use them. This ability also works on uh, zombies if you're working in a zombie game. Now, as you can imagine, this is an ability that feels very snowball-y, but it is very, very RNG. You're going to want to try to send your melee warriors out to try to convert barbarians. Hopefully, in what you can find are two-for-one deals. Generally, if you find a barbarian camp, there's usually a spearman in them, but you can go ahead and, and just stand there. Generally, a warrior will spawn every X amount of turns. Maybe you can get a free scout out of it as well. However, for the most part, you're going to be trying to go for two for one deals where maybe you get a spearman, a extra warrior, and you get a free clear of a barb camp, which gives you gold and error score, which honestly is very nice. But for the most part, you're not going to be snowballing out of control because it's only the warrior units that have this ability. However, there's a couple of really cool things about this. This can be very opportunity. Tunistic. Maybe you get a barbarian boat here for the era score. Maybe you get a barbarian camp cleared over on another part of the map. Maybe you get a couple of two for one deals. Now you have a, a very, you maybe you train two warriors and you end up with maybe five or six. That's more than you started with which is good, you get some free era score. You can always clear a barb camp that's far away from you uh, just to get some era score in a pinch if you need. But what's really nice is when you, you do get barb raided. If you don't know, when a barbarian scout finds your city and a big exclamation point pops up uh, above their head, they are gonna go ahead and now, they have now become alerted. They're gonna go ahead and run back to the barbarian clan and tell their buddies where your city is. At that point, the barbarian clan becomes enraged and will start spawning units turn after turn after turn for maybe about 10 turns. But like, it it can be a very, it can be a lot of units. It can be warriors, spearmen, slingers, barbarian horses, barbarian horse archers, a bunch of stuff that generally <laughs> is a real pain in the butt to deal with because in the early game, you are generally trying to build your scouts to explore, have a maybe a settler or two, maybe go for an early wonder. Things that you don't want to have to deal with because if you get barb raided, you are now being forced to build units to deal with the barb clan instead of actually doing what you wanted to do. However, Quinn has the very unique ability where he has the perfect counter to a barb raid. 
So if you do in fact get barb rated by maybe four, five, six, or even all the way up to like eight units, I think I've seen from barb raids, you convert a couple of melee units that you started with into a much larger army. At that point, you can go ahead and easily clear the barb clan and then you can go ahead and do whatever you want with it. You can explore, you can clear more barb clans, you can attack maybe another AI city that is not ready for that type of situation, or maybe even with the extra gold you got from the barb clans and the fact that you're going for masonry anyway because of your great wall, you can go ahead and buy a battering ram and go take out a city state very easily. That generally starts with walls on DED. So this is a very RNG and map dependent mechanic. However, there's a couple of things that could make this really, really interesting. Something I found was that your levied units still retain the convert barbarian action. So what you can do is if you find a city state that you first met, you can go ahead and immediately go for Imani. You can send Imani to that city state and then levy their units. For about 120 gold, you can access to about five warriors. For, you know, for reference, uh, a warrior is, a single warrior is actually more expensive than that. At that point, you can have five warriors that they can go find more barbarians to all convert into. At that point, when you convert the barbarians, you keep those units forever and the city state no longer has units, which means you can, I, you can then turn those units on a unsuspecting AI major civilization, or you can turn them back and to kill the city state with that battering ram that you just bought. It's an incredible play because then you can send a money to another city state and do the exact same thing. That's it's a very unique version of the Imani World Tour where you're getting first time Suzes for Aeroscorp, but you're also converting and clearing barb camps, you're getting free barb boats, you're killing early city states, you're leveling up your units, you're attacking other civilizations. There's a lot of potential for, for where this Sif can go. He has a very high ceiling, I would say, if everything happens to line up. However, he also has a very low floor if nothing happens. Now think about this ability. Barbs are very prevalent early in the game, but especially if you're playing a map like Continents, where all of the land tends to fill up compared to a map like Highlands, Barbarians kind of stop appearing in the game. So this ability becomes less and less useful further into the game that you go, generally speaking. However, you can use the ability every once in a while if you are falling behind in tech, you can easily, which you might be, which you might be if you're going for a culture game, you can easily trade up a warrior for a swordsman or a warrior for a barbarian man at arms, especially if you have Babylon in the game where you get man at arms at like turn 30. You can easily convert your warrior. You can trade up your warriors one for one or two for one for man at arms as long as they don't die. The other thing that's interesting about this mechanic is that it because it's a melee unit, they can actually take a couple hits. When I Whenever I would use the ability with apostles, my apostles will generally get stepped on before I can even use the ability, which is really interesting. Um, and the same thing with Boudica, she would get, she would end up getting stepped on and shot back home before I would be able to use their ability. But being able to maybe do an Amani World Tour, instant clear barbarians, get a get a great wall in the ancient era, you could very easily get a golden age in the classical era, pretty pretty reliably as a civilization but also you can be able to farm barb ray to try to get the most out of the barbarian conversion mechanic. There's also something really, really interesting that we found out. Um, shout out to uh, D Deccan for finding out this ability, but at the at buttresses is a wonder called Hagia Sophia. It, and this usually gives your missionaries and apostles an extra spread. However, apparently this works for Quinn's melee units. They get an additional charge. So you'll be able to convert once, keep the unit and get a second, a second conversion, which completely opens up the civilization's unique ability. The, the question is whether Hagia Sophia is, is early enough for barbarians to start being less of a problem. However, I would, I would encourage you to play, play them on maybe not the continents map, because of the ability for the sieves to be able to fog bust the entire map and barbarians to stop appearing. I would assume this ability works on other things that are classified as barbarians, like, reb like rebels that spawn from, from neighborhood 
sabotages, but it won't work from things like free cities, free cities and stuff like that. All in all, this is a pretty crazy mechanic. It is, it has a very, very fun feedback loop. All in all, this is a really interesting mechanic. I, I don't know if it's good because I played about four test games and three of them, I either didn't find barbs or the barbs didn't line up the way that I wanted them to for me to capitalize. But there was one game specifically where I immediately got barb raided right at the start of the gate and was able to convert basically three warriors into a standing army of about 12 units who then went and explored, um, including barbarian boats, horses, slingers, spearmen, warriors. What I did with them was that I just explored and I cleared more barb clans and I guaranteed my golden age. But I realized that Poland was right there in a very compromised location that would have been very easy to take. So I really am excited to see what I can do in the highest potential for Quinn because he is a very very, very RNG dependent sieve, depending on what's around you and also the availability of barbs. However, as much as he is a RNG based sieve, I would actually say he's a anti RNG sieve. What I mean by that is, especially if you play multiplayer, you'll understand the feeling of getting barb rated right out the gate, which then forces you, like I was saying, to focus on military when you didn't want to, and it kind of puts you behind on your early tempo, getting your cities and stuff out and then it's really really hard to catch up to all of the other players who had much better starts than you just because you got barb rated and you had there was nothing you can do about it quinn has the very unique ability to take bad rng that is a barb raid and flip it on its head where you actually end up ahead because you have more units than you started with and the barb raid was was taken out of is the perfect counter for the barb raid um that again it puts you ahead and it's really, really interesting. So I would be psyched to try them out uh, for that reason. But also it, it is a big opportunity cost to, to miss out on other abilities like the original Quinn. But it's a very fun feedback loop if you can get it to work. And it's a very interesting mechanic that no other Civ has. And it introduces a lot of interesting play styles that you couldn't do in any other Civ. So I think overall, I think he's a successful Civ in that he introduces new play styles, new mechanics, and it's a fun feedback loop. I don't know if he's overall a strong Civ. I think he has, he'll have his moments, but generally speaking, he isn't as strong as other Civs. I don't know. What do you think about him? I would love to know your opinions in the comments. And uh, yeah, let's, let's jump on to some of the other new Civs. All right, let's also talk about the other one of the other leaders, Wu Zetain here of the Chinese Empire. She, of course, has all of these same abilities, but she also her leader ability is called the Manual of Entrapment. All offensive spies operate at one level higher. Whenever an offensive spy is mission, whenever an offensive spy mission is successful, you gain 50% of the culture and the science that the targeted city earned that turn. You get a free spy and extra spy capacity after discovering defensive tactics. Now. This may sound familiar to someone. Catherine the Black Queen also gets early spies. She also has an extra level of diplomatic visibility, but she has a free spy at castles. Now we can start by comparing those two castles over here in the medieval era, which is uh, which is definitely something that is quite early. Usually you don't get spies until all the way up here in the Renaissance era with diplomatic service. So Catherine gets spies one era early but uh, Wu Zetain gets her spies in the classical era, which is a complete two errors early before anyone else. Right here, defensive tactics, which is right after you get to your government, you can go straight up here to defensive tactics. This is incredibly early, which is amazing because you can, you'll be able to spy in other civs way before they have any other spies to counter spy. It's a ability that you get from almost the beginning of the game. And of, of course, with everything, the longer you have uh, access to a mechanic, the more useful it is. So she's definitely a Civ that wants to use spies as much as possible. You'll get your first spy capacity at Defensive Tactics. Uh, you can get your second one once you build your Government Plaza building, your Tier 2 building. That is the Intelligence Agency. You're definitely going to get this building because you get a spy and a spy capacity and all spy operations have a higher chance of success in your Governor title. The earliest you can get this would be when you are getting your very first tier two government, which is monarchy, the earliest one that you can get. So you'll come up here to defensive tactics, you'll probably grab feudalism, civil, come over here from monarchy. You'll then be getting a third spy once you get to diplomatic service. 
But at this point, you have three spies who have been operating through one or two eras. You can use them to steal great works if they have them. That might be a little bit early. Uh, recruit partisans isn't going to happen because no one will have neighborhoods unless Congo's in the game. Uh, generally, siphon funds is one of the most useful missions to be able to use in the early game. Also, stealing tech boost uh, or even just killing governors. Killing governors of other players is actually really, really painful. Uh, imagine, especially in an online game, to remove someone's Pingala for five turns in the very early game in the classic era when that's probably the only governor the only governor that they have access to is if Pingala they probably went Pingala went double down connoisseur researcher and grants kill this out of their capital you're slowing them down incredibly uh, and then you get just additional free culture and science by doing this 50% of a targeted city 50% of culture and science from that targeted city earn that turn that doesn't really seem like a lot. If you're going straight for the capital and killing a Pangala city, it could actually end up being quite a decent amount. But this is just free stuff on top of other things that you're getting, like tech boosts. And when you're stealing those techs and civics, those, of course, are not 40%. They are 50% boosts, which is incredibly useful. So there is some direct synergy between stealing tech and Dynastic Circle, which is actually something I didn't realize and actually kind of interesting. There's a couple of uh, key strategies to look out for when you're running, when you're playing as Wuzatan. Ideally, you're going to want to find this card as soon as possible at Diplomatic Service. It's called Machiavellism, and you get 50% production towards spies. Spy operations takes 25% less time. By the time you get here, you should have at least already two spies, which the spy operations taking less time will be nice, and the 50% production will be nice for producing your third spy, or if something happened to one of your first two spies, you can build another one and replace it here. Now, in order to be able to run this card more effectively, there's a couple of wonders that will help you out. The first one is the Patala Palace. This is a wonder that is at the Astronomy Civic. It gives you a diplomatic policy slot and a diplomatic victory point. The policy slot is what's important here. Being, getting an additional diplomatic policy slot will just be useful because it'll just give you one more green card to run in your in your government. Uh, very similarly, the Forbidden City here, which is actually a Chinese wonder, so if you're playing China, might as well go after the China Chinese wonders, give you a free wildcard policy slot. This, of course, will just help you run, uh, make sure that you're running your green cards and also give you space to be running other cards. But this will give between Forbidden City and Fatala Palace, you have two chances to get a free card so that you can run this Machiavellism card pretty much the entire game. And you're going to be running and running it, but you don't want to miss out on other green cards. So this is a really good way to get those. An another place you can get it is if you are playing Secret Societies, Owls of Minerva will give you a total of two policy cards. First at initiation is the economic policy slot. This will give you an economic policy slot, which of course you can't run mechanism, but it might free up one of your wildcard slots. The other one is at indoctrination, where you get a wildcard wild policy slot, but you also get two extra spy capacity, which means you could have five spies by the Renaissance era. There's more spies once you get through the tech and civic tree, um, we, we found that at this point you will have three spies if you're playing without game modes and you'll have five if you're playing with Owls of Minerva. There's another spy that you can get at Nationalism, Ideology, and at very fitting Cold War. So you'll, able, you'll be able to have a ton of spies running through your empire if you're able to run all of those different things. Now let's talk about how to make the most out of your spies. As we know, Wu Zetain gets all of her spies operate at one level higher than they usually are. So if, for instance, a spy when you first create it is a level zero spy, they can get three promotions, bring them to level one, two, and three. Basically, all your spies operate at one level higher, which is nice. You can also get free promotions from certain wonders like Terracotta Army. This gives you a free promotion on all of your military units, but this is also includes spies. Spies do count as military units, so getting a, a free promotion on a military that you're using to try to push through an enemy, uh, you can get all of the promotions on your military, but also you can get a free promotion on your spies. The other thing 
talking about military, is here at Embrasure with Victor. Military units trained in this city start with a free promotion that do not already have a free promotion. Now, this is really interesting because this does not help Catherine de Domenici spies. Catherine spies start with a free promotion, but this doesn't stack because it says already here, not already with a free promotion. However, Wu Zetain, all offensive spies operate at one level higher, They do, they, but they aren't one level higher. So if you use Victor Embrasure, you can immediately upgrade your spy to level one and they effectively work at level two. Also, when you're running, also when you have the intelligence agency, all your spies get a higher chance of success. I'm not sure how much this is. It might just be like 5%, but essentially if you get one free promotion and you have intelligence agency, all your spies will operate at basically level two, 2.5 basically. So anytime your spies are trying to do a mission, they will have a roughly 85% chance to succeed said mission before even gaining sources. So you can kind of skip the, the whole gaining sources mission and go straight to doing all the offensive missions, whether or not that's something easy like siphon funds, fabricate scandal, or form an unrest just to get that last level up. Uh, or you can go for the stealing tech boost, which again actually does synergize with that gymnastic circle because we get 50% of the civic, not 40%. You can steal great works, you can kill governors, which again, if you're killing governors in the classical era, uh, another player might only have one governor if they went like triple Pengala, you know, Pengala connoisseur researcher grants, and this is all in their capital. You can send your spies straight to the enemy's capital, who you know won't have any counter spies because it's the classical era. Who has spies in the classical era? Well, you can go ahead, you can send your spy there, you can immediately kill their governor, and that's gonna completely wreck their early game tempo, science and culture in the game. And you should be able to get a decent amount of science and culture out of it as well. And then you can also go ahead, you can steal tech boost, you can you can steal money, you can do whatever, whatever you feel is appropriate in that game and that's actually it's it's incredibly an incredibly fun mechanic because spies is such an interesting part of the game especially in multiplayer when people start getting mad <laughs> that there's someone spying on their cities they don't know who it is and they're freaking out and they're yelling at everyone now note um if you're spying the classical era they know it's you because you're who's attain unless there's for some reason two people playing the same civ uh, that is something that I've heard about in the CPL lobbies, is that if there's anyone spying in the medieval era where Castles is, everyone knows it's Catherine. So you do have to be careful <laughs> if you're spying this early into the game. People will know it's you unless you're playing as AI who are way too dumb to realize that. This ability is actually pretty, pretty well designed. I think China overall is almost always a culture sieve just because of how great the Great Wall ability is and their tendency to want to build some type of wonders and have defensive units like Crouching Tigers to be able to defend their wonder heavy cities. Manual of Entrapment is a very fun offensive mechanic that you can use to supplement the science that you're missing when you're generally going on a heavy culture game, boost your culture even further. You can use it in a war so you can you know, go ahead and use uh, you could use it for some early aggression because you'll have a spy on your opponent while they do not have one on you so that you can use their listening post ability to get a plus three combat strength bonus by having a higher level of diplomatic visibility on them than they have on you. Uh, you can combine that with Vic an early victor to get your spies promoted um, after the aggression as well as building terracotta army. Not to mention this many spies high level spies are devastating at stopping someone from getting a scientific victory by destroying all of their spaceports. Like there's a lot you can do with her. I think she has a very unique play style. Obviously very similar to Catherine, but kind of just a little bit different, different enough that you can go ahead, send your spies. You wanna try to spy on the cities that have the most science and culture, which generally those are cities that will have counter spies, but because you're using this so early, they literally can't have counter spies. And by the time they do get their spies up, your spies are already so high level that there's really nothing they can do about it. By the time you get to the Renaissance era, I would suggest moving your spies around if you're playing multiplayer, just so that people can't find where they are. But in general, this is a really fun mechanic. And I think it's just, it's a nice, interesting ability 
to subsidize a what is probably a strong culture game, but in a slightly more aggressive manner. Um, and I just think it's it, I think it's neat. I think it's neat. It seems fun. I'm excited to try her out. And uh, let me know what you guys think about her. All right, and lastly, Youngla. Uh, Youngle? Any Youngles? <laughs> Anyways, there's no debate. Youngla is um, an amazing Civ. Everyone, everyone agrees. Such a powerful ability. Of course, again, all the same China stuff, but his main ability, all cities receive a project where they convert 50% of their production into food, faith, or 100% if it's gold. Cities with 10 or more population receive two gold, one science, and one culture return for each population in this city. There's two parts to this ability. We'll talk about the first one, and that's the projecting. So let's just go ahead and settle here, and we'll, we'll see what this is like. So you can see we have three projects here. Generally, this is where you'll find your city projects. If you're unfamiliar with how city projects work, I'm gonna go ahead and go to campus research grants. So a city project is a project that's unlocked when you build a district. It gives you science, faith, gold, culture, or whatever whatever respective yield that is to the district. It gives you 25% of your production per turn converted into that yield per turn. It also gives you a boost of great people once it is finished. If you look at Holy Site Prayers, which is the, the most common project that is used for projecting a relig religion, this district provides faith and 100% religious pressure every turn. That's something unique to this, but awards great person points once finished. The last part is usually what people are using the project for, to try to secure the last religion, if the religions are going very quickly in the game, or to secure an earlier religion. Campus research grants is often used if you want to try to secure the uh, first scientist. For instance, this one, uh, I know Hypatia is one that is often Projected, projected first very often in the game. But yeah, though, so those are 25% production. These are 50%. So this is actually just a better holy site prayer that is unlocked immediately and available before you build holy sites. So if you want, you can work this immediately and you convert 50% of the production instead of 25% immediately into faith return. That means our four fate or four production per turn becomes two faith per turn immediately off the start of the game, which means you can rush a very early pantheon uh, in addition to just getting extra faith. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing this. Yes, you could go ahead and spend a probably, what was it, uh, you know, 10 or 12 turns getting your getting getting your pantheon pick and then you can like pick religious settlements, get your early settler and go from there. However, if you have to spend 12 turns working on a on faith return, that's basically the, just to get the the free settler. That's basically spending those 12 turns to build a settler, which like this will this this production goes down as as you grow. And I know this would become faster as well, but it yes, it's a very very early settler. But to to forgo your scouting and to have the possibility of finding goody huts, finding city state first meets, which also give you yields and all the other things you need to do in the early game. And maybe you find a goody hut that gives you faith. Maybe you find a goody hut that gives you a relic. To forgo all of that it just to sit here for 12 turns and do nothing, then work faith per turn, it doesn't necessarily feel good to me. What does feel good is working for a couple turns. Because for instance, you look at our spawn, we have no faith resources, which means we can't make faith return until we get to God King, where you get one faith, one gold, one faith and one gold in the capital. That is generally speaking, very similar to most of the other players in the game. Some of them might have a faith resource that they will be going for. Others might have a culture that helps them get to the God King card faster. But for the most part, most people can't get it until the same exact turn when they get God King and they all, everyone puts their God King card in at the same time. And I know this is especially true for multiplayer when everyone has to pick the Pantheon on the same turn, but it only lets one person pick per turn, which means you can often wait like an extra 10 turns just cycling through players in a big multiplayer game just for your turn for Pantheon, even though you had the required amount of faith like 10 turns ago. That's a pretty big multiplayer game, I'm sorry. But uh, how I feel is if you work this for like two or three turns, that could significantly boost your ability to get an early Pantheon and one of the first picks probably not first pick but one of the first picks for a pantheon while you're also doing your scouting and everything else i think that feels a lot better to me you you feel less irrelevant you don't have people coming in settling at you immediately there just seems to be 
better better alternatives to working this off the gate. Unless you specifically want religious settlements, then you know, yeah, sure, go for it. But I would argue you would want other things than religious settlements because the second part of Yongle's ability is that once you get to 10 population, all of your cities give two gold, one science, and one culture churn for every population in this city. That is wild. That is essentially like having connoisseur and researcher plus more like 20 gold per turn that's basically like having a, a pingala in every single city in every every single city of your empire once they get to 10 population it's insane the amount of passive yields that you can get from doing nothing but focusing on housing and food so in order to so I, I would say getting your cities up to 10 population as soon as possible is incredibly important. Now, getting to 10 population is actually harder than you would think because there is a housing capacity. Uh, if you settle on fresh water, you can start with five housing. And the capital here says six because the capital also has the, the palace, which gives one housing. Once you hit one below your housing capacity, once you get to one population below your housing limits, your growth rate will be slowed by 50%. That means you need twice as much food to grow the same population. Once you hit your housing limits, you will only grow 25% at the normal rate. Which basically means you, you almost essentially stop growing entirely once you reach these numbers. So you want to focus on housing immediately. Uh, so you want to settle fresh water. The other way is to get granaries. That will give you two housing, which is incredibly important, but that only that's only seven housing in your original cities. You want to get to 10, which means you could also use uh, aqueducts, which will give you an additional two housing if you're already on rivers. That's nine housing. You could also get housing from a government from Classical Republic, which will give you one housing and one amenity. This gets you to your 10 housing cap, which means you can get there. You could you could technically still get there um, without without the use of anything else. However, that's a very long time if you have to use both Classical Republic and aqueducts, which, you know, you can get relatively early. It is the classical era, uh, but also getting granaries, all those things. There's a few things that will help you out in specifically, wonder-wise. And there is, of course, Temple of Artemis. Temple of Artemis will 100% should be one of your priorities whenever you're playing with Yongle, if you can. It does require a camp, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have one in this spawn. But for instance, if we did, this would give us four food and three housing in the cap. That would significantly help increase the speed that the capital grows, but also lets it grow way higher than it would have by itself. It also gives amenities, which are super important. Your amenities are incredibly important to growth. So if we look at happiness here, if you're able to get your content cities to happy, uh, there'll be a 10% growth increase as well as a 10% yield increase. If you get your cities to a static, it's gonna be 20%. So you'll see down here, you'll have growth from amenities. You'll see a modifier there. Getting food, housing, and amenities are gonna be your three most important things. Temple Artemis does all three of those for the capital or whatever city this is built in because it gives amenities based off camps, pastures, and plantations. It gives food and it also gives housing. I'd recommend getting the hanging gardens. Usually I actually don't recommend this wonder because 15% growth is nice, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't have the housing to sustain that type of growth because this this plus two housing only affects the city that's built in and every other city, city you, you still need to focus on that housing to make it worth it. But since we are doing that, I actually do highly recommend this wonder for this type of build. So building hanging gardens is huge. Getting the temple of Artemis is huge. Getting Colosseum for amenities is massive. And anything that gives some type of housing. And for later on, Anchor Wat is also a really nice wonder because it just gives you a free population and housing in all of your cities. You can also get housing from districts if you're unfamiliar. Things like campuses. Campuses won't give you extra housing. Neither will the tier one building, like the library. But the tier two building, like the university will, will give you plus one housing here. Just pay attention to certain ways to get housing. Uh, this is actually an interesting contender for building a preserve, because preserves will also give housing, grants up to three housing based on appeal. So would you like to put this on a breathtaking tile, for instance, this one? That will also boost the food on adjacent tiles with groves. Just be careful because you need to make sure you will have enough breathtaking tiles to make this worth it to get the two food, two faith, and two culture on unimproved breathtaking tiles. The mines here make that much more difficult. Uh, another source of early growth though, would be would be Magnus here. So Magnus will give you a 
His first promotion will give you 50% yields from plot harvest and feature removals, which helps you chop out certain things like chopping out wonders like Temple of Artemis and Hanging Gardens. He also helps you manage your population with provision so you don't lose population every time you build a settler, which will help you get to your 10 pop in your capital very fast. But also going with surplus logistics is a massive increase to your growth for not only for this city, but for all your cities. And here's why. If you have 20% growth in this city, that's just 20% growth. Just that that's that's massive in this city. Also, all of your domestic trade routes ending here get plus two food for their starting city. So if I have another city over here, I have Magnus in Beijing and I'm sending a domestic trade route to this city, I'll get additional plus two food on this trade route. When you trade with a city, you get yields based off of the districts that are in a city. You may be familiar with trading internationally and you can see you get the three goal from trading with a city, uh, specifically the city center. However, if you trade domestically you get one food and one production this is expanded every time you trade with a district so when that city builds a campus international trade routes gain one science but domestic trade routes gain one food if you trade with a seat with a city that has a holy site International trade routes give one faith, but domestic trade routes give one food. And if you trade with a city that has a commercial hub, international trade routes give three gold, but domestic give one production. You'll notice it's, it's however, there are two magic districts that give you both food and production. Those are the government plaza, which gives gold to international, but domestic, see, you get plus one food and plus one production. And the Diplo Quarter will give you one food and one production to domestic trade routes. So if you're able to go ahead and go to your capital, maybe you go for a holy site to try to get something like River Goddess and you get maybe Feed the World, I don't know. But if you go ahead and you build your government plaza and your Diplo Quarter in your Magnus City, all trade routes to this city all domestic trade routes, one, two, three, four food from districts, two food from the trade route, which it will now be six food per turn. So your domestic trade route will immediately be giving you six food and three production right off the bat, which will help this city grow very, very quickly and also build the infrastructure that they need. And, and then you can go ahead and build a commercial club or a harbor in this city that can give you either a market or a lighthouse. You can get another trade route and then have another city send that trader to this city send it back to magnus have this one do the same thing where you bid a harbor or a commercial hub you get another trader to another city build the same thing and now all of a sudden all of your cities have internal trade routes each giving six food and three production to each of your cities helping all of your cities grow not just your capital it's a very very strong ability to use if you know how to use it and with that much food, you'll be growing very fast. You'll get a lot of extra production, which will help you build your infrastructure. You'll have a whole bunch of extra gold from these districts. Mind you, you're only gonna build, what, one of these each. You have a bunch of extra gold, which will help you buy things like granaries, which will help your cities continue to grow. And then you'll also have all of your cities pop off very, very quickly. For instance, if you have things like, you know, hanging gardens in one city, and Temple of Artemis in another. Like you can have a ton of food, get a bunch of cities grown up really, really fast, and you'll be absolutely unstoppable once you get to 10 population. Because even though this build won't have any early science or culture, what you will have is a whole lot of gold, a lot of production, and a lot of tempo. And then you get all of your science and culture to just just pop off out of nowhere. Then you can build things like your campuses or your theater squares. And then you just absolutely pop off in all stats in every direction. And then you uh, decide what victory condition you go for. Obviously the other abilities really def definitely help you achieve this. Your dynastic circle encourages wonders like hanging gardens and the great wall and crashing tiger will help keep your city safe as well as give you a bunch of gold and culture and tourism as you go. Again, very, very strong city, fan, very, very strong sim, fantastic, uh, borderline broken. This is incredibly strong. This, uh, this is definitely a contender with the Kamai and with uh, Tokugawa now, with how strong that this is. Speaking of, I'm realizing how similar his playstyle is both with Kamai because they have huge bonuses 
So having holy sites on rivers and going with the river pantheon as well as things like their prasats giving a whole bunch of tourism based off of having 10 population or and higher as well as tokugawa and in beef in beefing up all the internal trade routes that you can get to the most ridiculous degree and i'm just so excited i'm so so excited to play them and uh yeah and that is all five of the chinas i think no matter what i think all of them are very very strong culture contenders um at least cultural defenders in a game because of how much culture you can get from all these great walls i think most of these games i think with all these sieves you, you open up with some type of either gold or faith and you try to get a lot of science as well try to get the castles as soon as you can and then get all the way up to flight in the meantime use your builders as effectively as you can to place down as many walls as you can you can use war to your advantage if you are comfortable and if you see an opportunity to strike get some wonders along the way and then each of them has a slightly different avenue of getting there Quinn wants to build as many wonders as possible. Kublai Khan wants to build a whole bunch of trade routes. Quinn the Unifier wants to use barbarians uh, effectively to unify the local lands. Zwu Zatan just wants to use her spies as much as possible, but it's specifically to get tech boosts, which are better with Dynastic Circle, and to keep her in the running on a technological basis, I believe, when she's going for a culture win. And Yongle wants to go for a whole lot of food, a whole lot of yields, and a whole lot of fun. What do you guys think about these new Chinas? Do you love them? Do you hate them? Leave your comments down below. I am so excited to play all of these. I will be playing them on stream at White and Nerdy TV at Twitch. So go ahead and please follow me over there. These videos do take quite a bit of time. So if you could please subscribe to the channel, I would love to get to 100 subscribers. If you guys could all leave a comment to the goddess of algorithms pantheon and thumbs up the video. I would deeply, deeply love you all. Anyways, hope to see you online and on the next videos, and uh, have uh, fun yongling.